a message from the Bible that is built around what is about to happen in Washington, D.C. And the reason that I bring this to you is because it's going to affect the church in many, many different ways. And I'll try to share some of those ways with you today. But the title of the message that I want to preach to you is we must evangelize now. Uh, we cannot continue to wait. We must now begin to share the gospel with those that are lost. To let them know what thus saith the Lord is more important than what thus saith man. And so evangelizing now because time is running out in which I believe that the culture of America is going to try to silence the churches that preach against sin. Now, they won't necessarily try to silence uh, the churches that will mention the name Jesus. They don't like it, but they will let them mention the name Jesus because he is an historical figure from the Bible. But they want us to be silent about sin. And this Equality Act that they are talking about in Washington, very seriously, they are talking about this to silence the people and to silence the Word of God. Now, the Equality Act simply says this. It would provide consistent and explicit non-discrimination protection for LGBTQ people across the key areas of life, including employment, housing, credit, education, public spaces and services, federal funded programs and jury services. Now, if you look at what they're saying here, is that they're going to pass a law that says that we have to do these things. But what caught my eye was it said for the LGBT people or Q people, said uh, across the key areas of life. One of the key areas of life is where you're sitting this morning in the house of God. That's the most important area that there is in life. And then it put the word in, including, including these other things. Now, is this serious? Yes, it is. Now, how close are we? It's already been passed by both houses of Congress in March. But it was sent back to the House, and it would add these three things. Sexual orientation, gender identity, and it would ban discrimination in public places. Those other things are important. This place right here at Antioch is a public place. I believe it says on our marquee out there, everyone is welcome and those that are members are expected. So we are a public place that keeps our doors open to anybody that wants to come in and hear the gospel of Christ. Now, how close are we? It passed again in the House in May. But the Senate and the President's signature is all that is required before this bill will be passed. The purpose of this bill is to make the culture of America inclusive. In other words, you could discriminate against no one. What does discriminate mean? It means to make a difference. Now, if you'll read your Bible and you'll study about the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll study about God on through the Old Testament and the New Testament, God did discriminate against people. And if you don't believe that God discriminates, then just wait till the judgment. Just wait and see. 
God discriminates against people. Why? Because God is different. Because we are different. We are different from the people of the world. Jesus said that. He said that over in his prayer in John chapter 17. When he said that we were in the world, but let us not be a part of the world. He said, Father, keep them from not being like the world. And so discrimination is something that goes along with serving Christ. You know, discrimination simply means not to, be, to, to make a difference. We are not like the drug users. We are not like the alcoholics. We are not like the thieves. We are not like the liars. We are not like those that are lost. When God saved us, he called us to be what? Different. So then we're different. And we cannot adjust. And we cannot give in to the laws of this world and to the things of this world. You say the Bible says that we are to obey the laws of the land. It does say that. As long as the laws of the land are in accordance to the word of God. Because the word of God is the first law. It is the final law. And it will, I will not die according to to the world's law, but I will, and have to answer to it, but I will die according to God's law, and I will answer to that. And we feel intimidated, don't we? How do you think Moses felt? In Exodus chapter 5, when verses 1 and 2, when the Bible tells us there that God told Moses and Aaron, said, go to Pharaoh. And tell them, Lord said, let his people go. How do you think that they felt going against the leader of Egypt? Do you feel like that Moses felt a little intimidated? Yes, he did. But you know what? He went anyway. And he did what the Lord said do. But I want you to look in Exodus. And look at what he said. In Exodus... Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And afterwards, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh. Who is Pharaoh? He's a man with great power. He's a man that owns the children of Israel that are in bondage there. And he said, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Can I just tell you today that most of the people that, that are making the laws that's going against God today and the things of God, they're just like Pharaoh. They don't know the Lord. They don't know who the Lord is. Pharaoh wants to keep the, the children of Israel because they were under bondage to him. They were making him rich. And they wanted to keep things as they are. The government wants to keep us as we are, so we'll continue to make them rich. Moses, I'm sure, was intimidated. But here is another part that we have to be concerned about. And the dangers that we look at in evangelizing now is how did the Israelite people respond to Moses and Aaron? Look in Exodus 5. Look over, if you will, in verse 21. And they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because you have made our Savior to be aborted in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servant." to put a sword in their hand to slay us. Now let me just tell you, when you take a stand as a church, just like Moses took a stand against Pharaoh, Moses was being obedient to God. And I'm going to tell you something today. If, we be a, if we're going to be obedient to God, not only will the world leaders reject us, but also 
those Christian leaders will reject us also. The very people that Moses was trying to help turned on him and he said, all you're doing is making it harder on us. And you know what? That's the way it is when we as Christians take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Those weak Christians that are afraid and they're afraid of what might happen to them just simply says, be quiet now, you're making it harder on us. Am I right? That's what we are. Moses didn't let it stop him. Daniel, in chapter 3, verses 4 and 6, the Bible tells us there that Nebuchadnezzar, there in the land of Babylon, built an image, and he wanted Israel to bow down, and all the people to bow down to that image. In verses 4 and 6 of chapter 3, look at what it says. Then and hurled a cry aloud to you is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the polystry, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. And whosoever falleth not down and worship shall the same hour be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. These three Hebrew boys, they were told that they had to bow to the government. That's what they were saying. Bow to the government. The Hebrew boys, the Hebrew boys said no. No, the music can play. The laws can come out of Washington. They can come out of Raleigh. But we're not going to bow down. We're not going to bow down to the images that the world is giving us today. We'll be like the three Hebrew boys. This says, no. We'll take the fiery furnace before we'll bow down before these false gods. And if they hadn't have took a stand, if they hadn't have said, no, I'm going to tell the story of Jesus everywhere I go. I'm going to tell people what the Word of God says. I'm not going to bow down to the image of this world, but I'm going to bow down to the image of Christ. And because they took a stand, there in the fiery furnace, they had a fourth man to come walk with them. That fourth man will walk with us. He'll walk with us. If we'll not bow down to the culture of this world, but we stay faithful to Christ. Daniel chapter 6, verse 5. The people there, because of Daniel's high, high relationship with the leaders, said, what could we do to bring him down. So they decided that they would work to bring Daniel down through Daniel's God. That's exactly what they want to do to us today. To bring us down by going through our God. They said, let's have a rule that says you can't pray to but one God. Let me tell you something, folks. Don't you not see that's already at work today? In the public places today, we're not allowed to pray to our God. We're not, we're not, they're in school. We're not allowed to openly pray to our God. It's the Equality Act it wants to silence us. They wanted to silence 
Daniel from praying. But Daniel said, I will continue to pray. And he did. But he had to, and when he did, he had a wonderful experience that God showed up in that lion's den. You see, we want God to show up. But we want him to show up with us compromising and accepting what the culture of this world is offering us today. Our culture is a holy culture. Our culture is a Christ-centered culture, not a world culture. Daniel would not give in. So they went through his God. What they were going to try to do is to tell us that we cannot discriminate by preaching against sin. What will we do? Here we will preach against sin. But I can tell you that in multitude of places here in America they will be silent to what the Equality Act says and they will do as it says. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 11 and 12 he said you will be persecuted for doing the right thing in my name. Those are my words. But he said you will be persecuted. We have to expect it church. If we're going to do what's right, we have to expect the persecution to come. I, I don't want a pat on the back from those that are against me. I, I don't want those that, that's against the things that we stand for here at Antioch. I don't want their hypocrisy. I want the Lord's blessings upon us. In John chapter 15, verse 20. He said, you'll be persecuted for keeping his sayings. You turn there and read it, and that's what it'll tell you. Now, let's look at this a little deeper. The church is going to soon be raptured out. And there's a lot of undone things that the church must do. There's a lot of undone things that Antioch must do before the church is raptured. I believe that. But we're going to have to go against the grain. God always and his people has always had to go against the grain. God and his people was always the minority, not the majority. All the way back through studying the Word of God. Now, let's look at what this means. And what I have here is a magazine that came from Billy Graham organization. Decision. Franklin Graham and their organization has done the research and studying on this. And I wanted to try to give you some things that they've interpreted here as they have studied it, and how that it will affect us. Will the faith-based, non-profit required to abide by this law? Well, here's what they found out. Churches, religious schools, and other faith-based non-profits would be required to abide by the newly framed Civil Rights Act and related codes. The law would make no exceptions for religious institutions and explicitly invalidates the Federal Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Right now, that act gives us the freedom here at Antioch to worship the Lord, to preach as we see fit. But if this is passed, it would invalidate that Federal Religious Freedom Act. Faith based option, adoptions, agencies, or women's shelters would be forced 
to shut down through this. So then, churches of faith, like us, somewhere in this would be forced to abide by this law, this federal law. How would it affect us? Well, let's continue to go on and look at it a little more. It would affect parenting of children. Proverbs 22, 6 said, train a child up in the way it should go, and when it gets old, it will not depart from it. Listen to what the study has shown. The rights of parents to make choices for their children on questions of sexuality or gender, including medical treatments, would be superseded by federal civil right codes. The law would also strip parents of the right to raise and educate their own children if their belief contradicts government mandates. California already has this in play as a state law. It's against the law. If you think that your child is questioning its gender, it's against the law in California for you to talk to your child and try to convince it that it's one way or the other. That's real, folks. It's real. And yet we sit by idling, and some people would say, why, you're preaching politics in church. I'm not preaching politics. I'm preaching right and wrong. I don't care about Democrat and Republican. They can all go out of business as far as I'm concerned. I'm just interested in one thing, right and wrong. What does God stand for? Not what parties stand for. The fact that a parent should be able to raise his own child. Who better could talk to its child when it's having discussions about sexual orientation other than the parents because they know the child. But the government will mandate that it will be outlawed. Another one is gender, private. Spaces. Listen to what it says. Male bodied, male bodied, transgender women would have right to women's private spaces such as bathrooms, locker rooms, prison cells, homeless shelters, women's shelters, hospital rooms, women's conferences, college dorms, elderly care facilities, and sports leagues. Another way, a man can go in the woman's locker room if he wants to, as long as he thinks he's a woman. You know how silly that is. Me and my wife, yesterday was going to the bathroom. And when we got there, and her bathroom was right beside of mine. I stood there for a minute, and she said, What are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure out which one I am today. <laughs> That's all a joke. But it's really real. It's really real. It is so sad when we think of those things. Losing your private spaces. Is that important? What about nudity? Is that important? Being a man and being a woman, is that important? God thought it was important. Because, you know, in, when we think about all these things, uh, we, we think about what God said in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. When he created man and woman. And then he didn't leave it there. He said male and female. God made a difference. God put a difference between the two. And if the law says that we're discriminating by sticking with what the Word of God says, then we're just going to have to discriminate. Because we're going to have to believe what, what the Bible said. 
But you know something else? There's something to this that, that we need to, to learn about. And that is, what did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? What was the first thing that they recognized when they sinned? That they were naked. And what did they do? And went and hid. They went and hid. And they tried to cover up their nakedness. And, and whenever God came calling for them, these are my words, he said, what are you hiding for? Adam said, called when naked. He said, who told you you was naked? God put something in us that lets us know what a man is and what a woman is and how private it is. Because sin had invaded it. If Adam and Eve were ashamed and they were the only two people on the earth, then don't you think we ought to be ashamed too to be seen out half clothed, naked? But the equality, you know what went on up here in Asheville just a few days ago? I mean, you know what went on in Asheville? Asheville. Two hour, uh, what, hour and 45 minutes or hour and a half drive from here. You know what went on? They had a weekend of the women didn't have to wear any tops at all. Public. Did, did y'all know that that went on in Asheville? Yeah. And you see, they, they have that right. And this, and this Equality Act would tell us that we can't discriminate against them. In other words... I wouldn't have a right to go up and say to you, hey woman, you need to put something on. Or tell a man, you need to put something on. They could get you. Find you and put you in jail. My friend, it's a more serious thing than we think it is. But also, it invades the medical field. Doctors, this is according to their study, pathologists or psychologists, psychiatrists and counselors would be coerced and threatened to abide by the new sexual orthodoxy. They would have to go by it. If you went to get counseling, you'd have to You'd have to go by what the law said. Federal law. The Equality Act. It's powerful. It is powerful. And, and, and it says here also medical entities and workers from doctors to nurses to technicians would be, and some of you, this is a part of you. Listen to what it says. Medical entities and workers from doctors to nurses to technicians would be required under the Equality Act to provide, perform, or participate in sex or gender-related treatments, even if they claimed a sincerely held religious or professional objection. ADL says, and insurance plans would be forced to cover such treatments with no exemptions. As already in the case of many educational settings, Teachers and professors would be required by federal civil rights laws to respect a, a person's gender identity by not calling them boy or girl or man and woman. Is this real? Yes, it is. It's, a, it's invading every part of our life. But what is the purpose behind it? It's to silence us with the message of Christ. To silence us from the message that God has commanded us that we go and evangelize. Now, listen to this. The case of a fired Atlanta fire chief 
Kelvin Cochran, is a prominent example of where the Equality Act would take the nation. Chastain, that's the guy that did the research, says Cochran, who has since won a lawsuit in federal court and received damages from the city of Atlanta, was fired in early 2015 for writing a Bible study, State of Oregon, on Aaron and no, and I'm, I'm sorry, I went to the, writing a Bible study for a men's group he taught at his church. Do you hear what I said? He was fired for writing a Bible study for a men's group he taught at his church. He briefly covered the Bible, sexuality, and God's plan for marriage. His book disagreed with the sexual orthodoxy of the left, and they went after him. Listen to this. A pastor of a large church in Atlanta told me that many of his members work for significant global companies in that city. He says they walk around petrified by the thought that someone might find out what their beliefs are about marriage, the silent speech and suppressing thought is un-American. But they're afraid to even tell people they're Christians. They're afraid to tell people what their stance is upon marriage and gender and abortion and these things. And, you, you, you know, if, if you're visiting with us, let's, let me just try to explain to you. I... I if we don't know these things, if we don't know these things, then how are we going to fight them? Every pastor in churches ought to be informing their people about what is happening. And pastors say, well, I'm afraid because it might offend the people. That's exactly, that's exactly what the Equality Act would do. Make us afraid that we might offend something and we become the people that are silenced. Did you know that it says that if you use boy or girl and don't use a pronoun that takes the place of it, you can be fined or sent to prison under this Equality Act. You, you see, today God has called us to go. God has called us to evangelize. But our biggest enemy, our biggest enemy is our own government. That's the biggest enemy we have today. Satan has got into our governments and they're trying now to defeat us. But listen, let me just give you a couple of things to think about. We cannot be silenced. We must not be silenced. Why? Because we are God's witness. What does that mean? It means simply this. In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree there that was a witness of God. In Noah's day, there was an ark that he built under God's direction that was a witness for him. You come on in the Old Testament and you find that there was a Jewish nation that was a witness of God. Today, the church is a witness for God. So we cannot be silent. If, 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 if we're silent, then there is no witness for God. There's no spokesman for Him. Our approach must be like Jesus. That we just continue. Even though Jesus had opposition, they tried to put him to death. They tried to silence him. They tried to trick him. They tried to do everything that they could to silence his voice. But he could not be silenced. Did you know that we can't be silenced either. No. The only way we can be silenced today is by our own choice. 
Because you know what, number two? is We're not number one as we are his witness. Number two, we possess his power. His power. There's no power greater than God's power. He's called us to witness in his power. And this morning, no matter what the obstacles are that we face, no matter what persecution that may come our way, we have the power to be a witness for him. That power has been illustrated time and time again throughout history. Not only in the biblical days was the power of God manifested against opposition, but even in the days of America, the days of America when people wanted to shut down the voice of God. I'm thankful today there's a voice of God still out there. The power of the Holy Spirit of God is still working. It's still working to get the message out. And if there's one thing I want to be, church, I want to be one of those that are preaching and getting the message out. If I can't do that, I'm not, I don't even want to live. I'd just soon to die if I can't tell the message, get the message out. Lord only knows I don't want to be a compromiser. I don't want to be one that's afraid. I don't want to be one who just accepts those things. I want to be like those three Hebrew boys. I want to be like Daniel. I want you to be like that too. Why? Because you have the power of God's Spirit in you also. Forget about Forget about the, the culture of the day. Forget about politics. Put, forget about all this political malarkey. That's all it all is. But Jesus is not political. Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Jesus consults with no one. He says, I do what my Father tells me to do, and they're the same. I want to be like Jesus, not afraid. We are the evidence of God's great grace. Now, what does that mean? That means that I stand here this morning preaching probably a controversial message that 90% of the churches in Wilkes County wouldn't even let me preach it. But I'm here preaching it this morning, not in myself. I'm here preaching it this morning because of the grace of God. I'm just like you. It'd been a whole lot easier this morning to kicked out the recliner, turn on the TV and just sit there. Been a whole lot safer. But I don't want to be like that. I don't want you to be like that. I want you to be evidence of God's grace working in your life. I don't, I want you to be one of those that says, I don't know why I do it, I just do it. I don't do it in my own strength, so there must be a reason behind it. And that reason is the Spirit of God that empowers us and tells, says, go tell about my grace. You see, once we have heard we're responsible in making a decision. You heard about the grace of God this morning. If you're lost, so you are responsible 
for the decision about what you will do with that grace. But for us that are saved, we have received the grace of God. And we are accountable. Accountable to God. For what we have received. That we are to pass it on and tell it to others. The question is to you. Just like Jesus asked the question in Matthew chapter 16, verse 15, when he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? That same question is put to you. Who do you say that Jesus is? Do you say that he is a Savior worth following? you say that he is a Savior worth giving your life to? Do you say that he's a Savior that you're willing to? to be persecuted for. Do you say that he is a savior worth dying for? Do you say that he is a savior that is the Lord of my life and the Lord of your life? Who do you say he is? What do you think of him? When fear comes over you, when you think about the odds against us, what do you think of Jesus? When you think about how that Someone could come in those doors and start shooting. Do you fear or do you think of him as one that is able to take care of us and protect us? I'm a firm believer. I am a firm believer that God is with us and he'll take care of us. We're the channel. You know what we're called? We're the overcomers. You want to be an overcomer? We can overcome the Equality Act if it's passed, and no doubt it will be passed. Will we be overcomers and evangelize for Christ? God is trying to build a building. God is trying to build a congregation. You want to be a bit part of that building process? Instead of a building the house, do we want to crawl under the house? I want to be found building. And that's what I want you to do, is to be found building. Oh, this morning, as we bring this to a close, I hope God will speak to all of you.